Hello everyone and welcome to the Clinical Trials Project Management Series provided by the Case Western Reserve Clinical Translational Science Collaborative. The series will be presented across four modules. We began the series with an introduction to project management in clinical trials. In modules two and three, we will go into the details about the project management life cycle and the project manager's role at each stage. Finally, we'll cap off the program by presenting resources for project managers and study teams, which are available from the CTSC. Today, we'll focus on the initiation, assessment, and planning phases. The objectives of this module are to describe the application of project management practices during initiation, assessment, and planning phases of the life cycle. Examples of tools and resources are included. Let's begin at the beginning, the initiation assessment phase. It's time to start our project. The initiation assessment phase is where we establish the details of our big picture elements. We begin with exploration, getting to know the study as it is right now. Gather and read all the information available about the study and make note of any key elements that are missing. Have an introductory meeting with the PI to get an understanding of the kind of support they need. Discuss the scope of your role and who should be invited to a kickoff meeting. Leverage this meeting to start developing a relationship. Building a rapport with all members of the team is important groundwork for establishing trust. Nurture these relationships as you work together through the project life cycle. Take the time to analyze the information you have to identify what you know and what you don't know. What do we know about the team and stakeholders that have been identified and what roles still need to be filled? What documents do we have and how complete are they? What content is missing? Avoid the temptation to knee jerk into answers at this stage. The goal is to start identifying assets and deficits so you know what questions to ask and to begin thinking about the path to achieving objectives. Knowing what questions you have will help you identify who needs to attend the kickoff meeting. The purpose of a kickoff meeting is to gather all of the team members and applicable stakeholders to define the elements of our big picture. This is an important step that should not be skipped. The kickoff meeting not only enables you to get the most efficient answers to your questions, but it also helps everyone understand the who, what, and how from the beginning. A meeting agenda is a must and should include discussion of all of our big picture areas. Minutes from the meeting are also necessary. Determine who will be responsible for meeting minutes in advance. During the meeting, you may want to consider using a project charter as a tool to document each element. If you do, take time to orient the team to the charter and its purpose. Scope. Include an overview of the study presented by the PI as part of the agenda and include time for questions. Team. If this is a newly formed team or has new members who haven't met before, introductions are in order. In general, what is their role? Stakeholders, who are they and what is their vested interest in the success of the project? These may be department chairs, managers, grant program officers, collaborators, etc. Risk and constraints. All of the project's risks may not be apparent at this stage, but it is important to manage risks at every stage. Even if risks aren't obvious at this point, there are sure to be constraints. Milestones. Now that we know who we are and have discussed the scope and objectives of our study, what are our key milestones? You remember from module one that we need defined milestones to establish our deliverables and identify the tasks associated with accomplishing them. What is the order of operations on these milestones? Where do we need to start? Which are dependent on others being accomplished first? We need this direction to set up our next meetings where we'll establish deliverables and their associated tasks for assignment. Time. Are there deadlines that we need to accommodate? When are they and what is due? Are they negotiable? Communication. How often are we going to meet? How do stakeholders want to be kept informed of progress? If there are subcommittees, how often will they meet? How are we going to share documents? Take advantage of the technology available at your institution to identify the best platform. Consider programs like Teams, SharePoint, or Shared Drives, but make sure that everyone is committed to the selected workspace. Having one place for all of the documents for the project will help keep information readily available and prevent version control issues. Since we've stressed the importance of meeting agendas and minutes, here's a sample so you can get the feel for what each should include. 
you see that both documents include the title of the meeting, when it was held, who was present or absent. They follow the same basic outline, what is to be discussed and who is leading the discussion. The agenda provides details about what will be discussed and approximately how long the team will spend on that topic. This helps to ensure that enough time has been allocated for the meeting. The agenda should ideally be included in the meeting invitation. Confirm agenda items with presenters and facilitators in advance. Topics should not be sprung on people. The minutes provide details about the discussion. For example, we see that one of the co-investigators had a question during the protocol discussion about why the PI decided on this dose of study drug. It isn't necessary to be a court stenographer, but having the high level details of the discussion is a helpful reference. Plus, having it in the minutes will serve as a reminder to our PI that he promised to send some information to his co-investigator. Be sure to capture what action items team members have committed to having ready for the next meeting and when that meeting will take place. The examples here are very formal, which may not suit the study team style. The team may choose to write minutes directly into the body of an email that is distributed after the meeting. Whatever the team decides, make sure that the format serves its purpose of communicating what happened during the meeting. We're ready to move on to the planning phase. During the planning phase, we're gonna draw out our roadmap. Where do our milestones, deliverables, and tasks fit into the project landscape? Who is going to be responsible for each and what is the due date or timeline to complete and how will we hold one another accountable? This is also when we're going to work out the processes for each phase of the study. What is involved in startup? What needs to be done and who's going to do it? How are we going to execute the study? For example, how are subjects going to be consented and by whom? How are we going to recruit for subjects? Are we going to use advertising? Where will subjects be seen for study visits? How are we going to monitor the progress of the study to make sure we're meeting our milestones and objectives? How will we make sure we're staying on budget and in scope? What is the plan for managing risks we identify? How will we know our plan is working or if it needs to be revised? What do we need to do to close out our study and what tasks is each team member responsible for? What information do key stakeholders need? Let's go back to our case study for an example of milestones, deliverables, and tasks. The first milestone for the project was submitting the IND application to the FDA. There are a lot of documents required for an IND, but one of these is the form FDA 1572, the investigator statement. The PI's curriculum vitae needs to accompany the form, so we need to collect that document. We also have to list any sub-investigators who will be on the study, so we need to discuss the form with the PI to make sure everyone is listed. Another deliverable is the protocol. One element we need is the sample size calculation, so we need to determine who is going to do the calculation and write that section. Does someone on the team have that expertise or do we need to seek out a resource? Wow, this is a lot to manage. How are we going to keep things moving? We need to hold each other accountable for progress. The best way to approach accountability is through documentation and communication. Write out the tasks and deliverables, who is responsible for each, how long it's going to take, and when is it due. Get into the habit of asking respectfully, how long do you think you'll need to get that done? Or when will that be ready? Communicate with the group about these details. Always use meeting agendas and minutes to make the best use of the group's time together and to have a reference of what was discussed and agreed upon. Leverage the technology available to form good communication habits. Programs like SharePoint and Teams that have capabilities for document libraries, communication posts, or instant messaging will help everyone have one place for managing documents and information. The easiest and most transparent way to manage tasks and accountability is by putting it out there in a document that the whole team can see. This is an example from the case study we introduced in Module 1. During the planning phase, the project manager laid out all of the deliverables necessary to achieve the study startup milestone. At the team's first meeting after kickoff, this project plan was discussed and agreed upon. Responsible parties for each deliverable were assigned and the anticipated amount of time to complete was recorded. At subsequent meetings, status was reviewed and necessary adjustments were made. In this example, the team decided that one period equals one week. This project plan functions like a Gantt chart, making the timelines for deliverables and meeting the milestone apparent at a glance. Discussing and agreeing upon plans as a project team is important, 
but those processes need to be written down so that they can be referenced and applied consistently throughout each stage of the project. In our comic, we see our PI and study coordinator are unsure about how to process these specimens. Certainly, a well-written protocol is a must, but having detailed plans for executing all aspects of your study will set you up for success. Getting into these details during the planning process will help you flush out risks and potential problems. The Manual of Operations is a study governance document, providing details about how various aspects of the study will be managed, the process, and who is involved. These often include reference to departmental and institutional SOPs for consistency with clinical operations wherever possible. The Data Management Plan provides the framework for what system will be used to collect data, when and how CRFs are to be signed by the investigator, and the process for locking the database when data collection is complete. The monitoring plan details how the trial will be monitored, which is required for IND IDE studies. It provides instructions on the frequency of monitoring visits, details on what data elements will be verified in the source, and expectations regarding monitoring reports. It is important to remember that these are living documents intended to be used and referenced and not just sit on the proverbial shelf. Changes in the study, such as protocol amendments, new risks, or revised risk management strategies, are times to review these documents and make any necessary changes to keep them relevant. While making our plans, we need to have an eye out for roadblocks. What is going to trip us up or delay progress? What elements of the protocol are we most likely to deviate from? Are there any experience or knowledge gaps that will impact the quality of our data or patient rights and safety? Are these things that we can control or plan for, like this detour sign? Or is it something that we're just going to have to wait out, like this huge herd of sheep blocking the road? What is the downstream effect of the roadblock and the management plan on the impacted milestone? Identifying risks during the planning phase is going to support our work at future stages. Failing to complete this step at this stage is not going to set us up to effectively manage risks after the project is up and running. What are the roadblocks or hiccups that are going to impact our milestones, compliance, budget, or timeline? What is the impact of those risks? How likely is this risk to occur? This comic strip is from the book Project Management Second Edition by Adrian Watt. Here's our project manager stick figure looking over this cliff that has appeared in his path. He could choose to avoid the cliff, just turn around and go a different direction. He could use something to break his fall, like his buddy setting up the trampoline at the bottom. He could pay someone else to jump off the cliff for him, or he could decide to accept the risk, take the leap and hope for the best. Each of these possibilities should be explored when looking at risk management to find the best solution. Let's review our key takeaways from this module. The initiation assessment phase should start with getting to know as much about the study as possible. What project elements are missing? What questions do you have? Start developing positive working relationships with members of the team early in the process and nurture those relationships throughout. Facilitate a kickoff meeting to establish the big picture items. A project charter can help guide the discussion and document the framework of the project. During the planning phase, we will establish our milestones, deliverables, and tasks. Be sure that the person responsible and timeline for completion of each is agreed upon. Build accountability into the workflow by documenting the who, what, when, and follow up with communication to the team. The work done during this phase is the framework for trial operations at every stage from startup, execution, and closeout. Risk assessment and management plans need to be developed during this stage to shape execution for effective monitoring and control. A project planner can help the team see at a glance who is responsible for what tasks and where they fit in the project timeline. Always use meeting agendas and minutes to ensure the best use of the team's time when together. Document operational processes, monitoring, and data management plans. In our next module, we will review the remaining three phases of the project, execution, monitor and control, and closure. Thank you.